Let's investigate the Schrieffer Wolf transformation. Consider a Hamiltonian that has the following form. The Hamiltonian H is equal to H0 plus epsilon times H1. What we're going to do is we're going to analyze this type of Hamiltonian. And H0 is considered to be the main Hamiltonian. It's the main chunk of the Hamiltonian. And this H1 is a small perturbation. That's why I'm putting this epsilon over here. Epsilon is a parameter that's going to tell us the order of terms. And in this video, we're going to be looking at second order perturbation theory. The Schrieffer Wolf transformation is an operator version of second order perturbation theory. It's going to allow us to diagonalize a Hamiltonian. And that is just going to be an approximation for the Hamiltonian, but that approximation is going to get us very far in describing the time evolution of this system. So H0 is going to be treated as a diagonal matrix. In the eigenbasis of H0, this is diagonal. And this over here is an off-diagonal bit. So this is a small correction that is off-diagonal. So we can imagine all of these guys as big matrices. If this is some big multi-qubit system, these are going to be huge matrices. And all of the diagonal terms are going to be absorbed into this. And all of the off-diagonal small corrections are going to be absorbed into this. So we have a lot of conditions that need to be satisfied in order for second-order perturbation theory to be a valid approximation. So let's get started with the schrieffer wolf transformation. I'm also going to define a anti-Hermitian matrix S. So S dagger is equal to minus S. That is its defining property. And we looked at this in the previous video in the quantum mechanics playlist. We're going to take the exponential of this S and we're going to sandwich the Hamiltonian in between those guys. And that's going to allow us to do a unitary transformation. And the unitary transformation is going to have the following form. It's going to look like this. H prime, the transformed version of the Hamiltonian, is going to be the exponential of epsilon s times h times the exponential of minus epsilon s. Again, we see epsilon appearing here. This is just a parameter that we can set equal to 1. In perturbation theory, it's useful to keep this parameter in the equations so that we can see what order each of the terms are. Zeroth order terms have epsilon to the power of zero. First order terms have epsilon to the power of one, and second order terms have epsilon squared, or epsilon to the power of two. If we see any terms that have epsilon to the power of three, or higher powers of epsilon, we're going to neglect those terms, because in this video we're just doing a second order perturbation theory approximation. So this is a unitary transformation that's going to take us from the Hamiltonian uh, in, in a given frame, and it's going to transform into another frame. And if we view the Hamiltonian in this frame, we're going to be able to uh, analyze the time evolution of the system more conveniently. So this is actually a trick to understanding the time evolution of systems in quantum mechanics. Because a lot of the times, uh, even if you know the Hamiltonian, it's very difficult to figure out the time evolution. But if you uh, look at the Hamiltonian from a different perspective, and you shift to a different frame, you might see a lot of insights that you wouldn't see if you kept it in the same frame. So this over here is an exact relation, where we're transforming this Hamiltonian into another frame. And you can see that this is time-independent. This is a time-independent transformation, because if, there, if it was a time-dependent transformation, we would have to add in extra terms. And those extra terms are something that we covered a few videos uh, before this one in the quantum mechanics playlist. Now, what I want to do is write this out using a special case of the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff formula. And we actually derived this in the previous video. So this is approximately equal to h plus epsilon times the commutator of s with h plus epsilon squared over 2 times the commutator of s with the commutator of s with h. So this is a nested commutator. We have a commutator within a commutator. And this is up to second order. We have a zero order term, a first order term, 
and a second order term. Higher terms would have even more nested commutators. We would have a commutator inside of a commutator inside of a commutator. And this, this form over here is actually a special case of the Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula. And we derived this uh, by using the Taylor expansions of these exponential uh, of, of the of these exponentials of the anti-Hermitian operator in the previous video. Now what I'm going to do is substitute this type of Hamiltonian into this relationship over here. So let's see what that's going to look like. We're going to have that this is approximately equal to this h is the same as h0 or h0 plus epsilon h1. So we have that epsilon there that tells us that this is a small qu quantity. It is small relative to this. And the next term over here is going to be epsilon times the commutator of s with h0 plus epsilon h1. And then the next term is going to be epsilon squared on 2 times the commutator of s with the commutator of s with h0 plus epsilon h1. And that is what we have over here. So now what we can do is we can uh, start to manipulate these commutators and group together some terms. So first, let's have a look at the zero order term. The zero order term is just h0. So that is this term, which is diagonal. We're treating this as a diagonal matrix. And then all of these other guys are just going to be corrections. So we know that h0 by itself is diagonal. And this small correction is off diagonal. And what we want to do is we want to absorb the information from here into the diagonal elements. And that is the process of diagonalization. We're diagonalizing the matrix because that makes it easier to work with. For a diagonal matrix, you can just read off the diagonal entries, and it's a lot more convenient to work with. So h0 is over here. That's the only zero order term. And now let's have a look at the first order terms. So those are terms that have one power of epsilon. So first, we have h1 that comes from here. And then if we look at this commutator, we have this term. So we have s and h0. We can take the commutator of those guys. But if we split this commutator up, we're also going to get a quadratic dependence. We're going to have epsilon times epsilon. This is something small times something small. So that's going to be small squared. So h1 is only going to be accompanied by one term. And that is the commutator of s with uh, h0. So that is what we have over here is the first order correction. And now let's have a look at the second order terms. So I'll just put an epsilon squared over here. What are the terms that we get? Well, we can see this, this term over here. This is the commutator of s with h1. That is going to have a coefficient of epsilon squared. So we have the commutator of s with h1. And what else are we going to have? Well, we're going to have contributions from here. So over here we have uh, an s and an s, and we have an epsilon squared. And then we have an h0. So if we just look at this term, uh, and we ignore this term, we're going to have a second order term. So that's going to give us the half of the commutator of s with the commutator of s with h0. So we have a nested commutator. And I'm going to go ahead and close this bracket over here, because we don't have any more second order contributions. We do have third order contributions. If you look at this term over here, it has an epsilon. And out the front, we have an epsilon squared. So we have epsilon squared times epsilon. That gives us epsilon cubed. But we're doing a second order uh, perturbation over here. So this is second order. Any terms that have epsilon cubed are going to get thrown away. We're going to neglect those terms. If we want to go higher, if we, if we want to go up to epsilon 3, epsilon to the power of 3, or epsilon to the power of 4, then we would include terms like this. But because this is a second order perturbation, uh, we're just going to ignore this term over here because it is too small to matter. Now we can see that we have a zero order term, a first order term, and a second order term. So this is the biggest contribution. This is a small con contribution. And this contribution is multiplied by small squared. So this is an even smaller contribution than this. What we want to do is get rid of this first order term. And we can do that by setting all of this equal to 0. If we set this equal to 0, then we can get rid of that term. And we can do that by choosing s to make this equal to 0. 
Because S is an anti-Hermitian operator that we get to choose. We are transforming the Hamiltonian into a frame that is more convenient for us. So we get to choose this S. And we can choose it to have this convenient condition. And if we choose that, then that would actually make this commutator over here equal to minus H1. And you can see why it is minus H1. It's because if this is equal to 0, then we want this to cancel out H1. So this commutator has to be equal to minus H1. And so in here, we can substitute minus H1. And let's see what that actually does. So what we're going to have is this is approximately equal to H0. This first order correction has completely disappeared. We're only left with a second order correction. And we can see that we have plus epsilon squared. And then we have this commutator of S with H1. That's from this term. And then we have minus 1 half the commutator of S with H1. So what is that going to be? We can close this bracket now. All I've done is I've substituted this minus H1 in here, and I've factored out that minus 1 out the front. So we have the whole minus a half. That's just going to give us a half. And this is equal to H0 plus epsilon squared on 2. And then we have the commutator of S with H1. So that's S with H1. So this is our second order correction. If we choose S to have this property, where this is equal to 0, then this is our uh, correction to H0 in the transformed version. So this is the transformed version of the Hamiltonian. So here is the procedure. What we have to do is, I'll we'll write this down underneath, because this is, this is a very important thing that we need to follow. So the hard part, the most difficult step, is to find, we have to find S. We have to find this anti-Hermitian operator S such that it satisfies this relationship. We need H1 plus the commutator of S with H0 to be equal to 0. And then once we have found S that satisfies this relationship, what we can do is we can just compute this. Then we have to compute H prime. And H prime is equal to H naught, which we already know, plus one half of the commutator of S with H1. So now that we know S and we already know H1 by definition uh, from, from the problem, we can just compute this commutator and add it to H naught. And that gives us this diagonalized version of the Hamiltonian. And you can see that I have set epsilon equal to 1. Because epsilon has fulfilled its use, the role of this parameter of epsilon is to keep track of the order of these terms. And as long as uh, we, have, we have found all these terms and we've gotten rid of the terms that are higher order than where we're truncating, uh, we, we no longer need this epsilon. So now we can set it equal to 1, and that gives us this. So how would you go about finding S? Well, if you're dealing with matrices, that could be 8 by 8 matrices, 16 by 16 matrices, what you can do is you can take this matrix and take this matrix, which are known matrices. You know this based on physical descriptions of your quantum mechanical system. And you can uh, make a big matrix S. And then you have a bunch of unknowns for all of the elements of that matrix. So then you can take this relationship over here, and then you get a bunch of equations in terms of knowns. So known values are in here and in here, but the unknowns are in S. And you can take those equations and solve them for the elements of the matrix S. There are other ways to approach this. You don't have to do it in matrix form. You can also do it in different ways. But the hard part, this is the most difficult part of doing the schrieffer wolf transformation. You have to find this value of S. And once you have that value of S, all you have to do is comp compute this commutator and add it to H0. And that is your second order correction. So what is that going to do if we think of it, this in terms of matrices? We're going to take a matrix that is diagonal plus off diagonal, and we're going to absorb all of the information from here into the diagonal components. So we're just going to have corrections to the diagonal parts of the matrix. And that's going to give us a Hamiltonian that is diagonal. We, we will have a diagonalized Hamiltonian that describes the time evolution of the system. 
it's not going to be 100% the same as the original Hamiltonian. It will be a second order perturbation, but it will be better than having to solve the more difficult Hamiltonian because we will at least have some idea as to what the system is doing. And that is, that is the purpose of analyzing these systems. We take a complicated system in quantum mechanics, we turn it into a approximate version of that system, and then we analyze that approximate version, and we can see if, if we can uh, model the complicated system with the approximate system. So that is the reasoning behind over here. So these are the steps. This is the difficult step, finding that anti-Hermitian matrix S, and then the easy step is computing this, because then we all, all of these guys are knowns. H0 is known, H1 is known, and S is known once you find it, and it satisfies this relationship. Another way of, of looking at, at this is, if we, if we look at this relationship, we can write this as, write this more explicitly in terms of the commutator. If we write the commutator out explicitly, this is the same as S H0 minus H0 S is equal to minus H1. So this is a more explicit way of writing this relationship. We have a commutator S H0 minus H0 S, and we just move this to the other side, and that's minus H1. So if you can find this matrix S, or this operator in general, it doesn't have to, we don't have to look at the matrix representation. If you can find that S, then it is an easy task to uh, just compute this commutator and find all of the corrections. And this is, this technique, which is called the schrieffer wolf transformation, is very useful when analyzing complicated systems in quantum mechanics. It gives you an approximate system that is more simple to analyze, and it can get you very far in describing some of the properties of the more complicated system, which is the, the real system that we're trying to describe. We're going to be using the schrieffer wolf transformation in other videos in the quantum mechanics playlist. You can find those other videos if you click over here.